Very good morning to you and thanks for joining us on The Breakfast. My name is Nyamgul Agaji. It's a Thursday, the 29th day of uh, August 2024. That means the month is ending. Tomorrow will be the last day of, well, okay, tomorrow will be almost the last uh, day in uh, the month, but the last working day in the month will be tomorrow as well. So 29th of August 2024 and we are glad that we could make it this far. When it started out this year, we started out this year, it seemed as if nothing can can let us see this day but we are here today and the most important day in your life is today. Every day you wake up you thank God for that day, you thank God for bringing you that far and you make the best of that day because you're not promised tomorrow and you cannot get back yesterday. Okay, today on the show, we're going to be looking at the fact that our president, Bola Ahmed Tinubu, will be holding talks with Xi Jinping in China. That's the president of China. He's traveling out to go talk to the president and some companies in China. We also I have a report from the National Bureau of Statistics, which has declared that domestic airfare has jumped by 25%, and that was in July. This is August. We don't know what uh, the, 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 the numbers are in August, but we'll find out later on. We'll also be looking at some top trending issues, uh, some things that caught our fancy in the course of the last 24 hours. And of course, we'll go to the press to see what headlines made it to the front pages to some of our national dailies. Once again, good morning and welcome. And let's go get our quote for the day and then return with the top trending. Stay with us. Capital isn't scarce, vision is. Capital isn't scarce, vision is. That's according to William Shakespeare, one of the greatest writers uh, of our time. Uh, he said that capital isn't scarce. What is scarce is vision. And that is so true. Have you ever heard the quote, the Nigerian quote, money miss road? Yeah, it means that if you have the money and you don't have a vision, you don't have a plan for it, you don't use it judiciously, then the money has just missed its way. That is what it is. It is not the amount of money that you have that will write your success story. It is the vision that you have. So if you have a good vision, sometimes you start small. You know where your goal is, where you're headed. And that is the vision that we're talking about. No matter how small you start, if you have a vision, then you will ultimately get to your destination as it is. So it is not the money that you're looking for. Anytime that you're blaming your uncles and your aunties and everything, it is not them that are the fault of what pred whatever predicament you're finding yourself. If you have a vision, there will always be funding in some way or the other because what people buy is not anything other than value. So if you have a vision and that vision will add value to other people, the funding will come. Everything that you need will come. So like the scripture says, choose you first the kingdom of God and every other thing shall be added unto you. Choose you first the vision that you uh, want to achieve of the vision of what you want to achieve and every other thing shall be added unto you. Because if you have value that you're going to add to, uh, to anybody or to society, there's always a way out of uh, selling, as it were, to people. Uh, so money is not your problem. Money, the fact that you don't have money is not the problem that you have right now. It is the vision. If it is good enough, you will work towards it from uh, humble beginnings. And we've seen a lot of people who were uh, hawking pure water on the street. Some people were selling plantain on the streets. Some people were selling a lot of things on the streets. Some people were um, uh, refuse collectors and all that, and they have become millionaires today. They had a vision, they worked towards it, and this is not me being a motivational speaker, but it's just the fact of it. Have a vision first before you worry about the money. That is what we are talking about today. So the words of William Shakespeare, we hope that it will shape you uh, this morning. It's the vision that is scarce, not the resources, not the money. 
Okay, we ho hope you've learned something from that quote this morning. Let's go to the top trending issues. Uh, tens of thousands of international students took to the streets across Canada this week in a wave of protests against new immigration policies introduced by the federal government. According to a report by City News Toronto, the demonstrations which drew approximately 70,000 students occurred in major provinces including Prince Edward Island, Ontario, Manitoba and British Columbia. The protests came in response to a series of immigration reforms that have left many international students fearing deportation. In June, the Canadian government further tightened regulations by announcing that foreign nationals would no longer be able to apply for PGWP, that is Postgraduate Work Permit, at the border. This decision has sparked fears among students who are concerned about their future in Canada. Students' advocacy groups have warned that many international graduates could face deportation once their work permits expire at the end of the year. So these are not only Nigerian students, they are students from all over the world who are resident in Canada. Now, the takeaway from this is that, you know, everybody, every, every right-thinking government should make the situation in their country so conducive that people wouldn't have to leave the country. Now, imagine if everybody who is an immigrant leaves Canada. Canada is going to be, they may go bankrupt. Uh, the same case for UK, the same case for America and everything. But these people have made the conditions in their country so well that it's attractive to people and everybody wants to go there. And the more, the merrier, as they say. When people come, they come with fresh ideas, they come with fresh uh, energy, they come with everything uh, that will make your country uh, move forward. I know that in, among these there could be some criminals and all that, but there's a system that always goes after these people and makes sure that they are brought to book and justice is done. So people are rushing to those places. So if it is a Nigerian, for instance, in the streets of Canada trying to protest and saying that immigration laws are so tight and all that, you will ask yourself, why did he in the first place leave Nigeria to go there? They want to get to that Canada because they know that they are going to get a good education. They want to go to Canada because they know that after that education, they are going to get a job that is better than the ones they have in Nigeria. They know that they are going to be secure because there's security all around. Job security is there, the physical security is there, the emotional security even is there, and the atmosphere is conducive enough. That's why people are leaving their places to go to others that they feel have greener pastures. So how many people, if, if you say the, the, the grass is not always greener on the other side, you will ask yourself as well, how many people are leaving Canada, for instance, to come to Nigeria because they are hoping to get greener pastures here because greener pastures can actually be anywhere. But how many people are coming here? So if you ask yourself that question and you find the answer to it, then you will know that there's something fundamentally wrong. Nigeria is a great country. I love Nigeria to pieces, as they say in Nigeria. I love Nigeria. A lot of people love Nigeria, but the reality on ground is that there are so many things that you would lack if you just stay back. So the people who want to jaguar as it is genuinely because they are looking for something to better their lives, you cannot blame them. There are those also who just want to leave because they want to tell people that they went abroad, they leave abroad, just that prestige. They are just doing it uh, for, for, for the name. There are people like that, people who are a success story back home in Nigeria, but they just want to be abroad. It's not like they are not having three square meals. It's not that they don't have the soft life that they should have, but they just need to stay abroad and be referred to as people who live outside Nigeria. You know, I live in Canada, I live in, in Brazil, I live in America, I live in Germany, I live in... Some people even would want to go to Afghanistan instead of staying back in Nigeria. And so people sell their ancestral lands and make a lot of money. Some people go out to these countries with as much as maybe 50 million naira. And you'll be asking yourself, what greener pastures are you looking for if you can afford 50 million naira back in Nigeria? Or is it what we're talking about here in, as the quote of the day today, that is vision that is lacking, lacking, not the resources, not the money, not anything, but it's vision. If you have a vision and you have 10 million, 20 million, 50 million in, uh, in Nigeria, then you're going to be a success story and only need to visit those places when uh, you are when you want to, you know, unwind.
Capital is not this, is not scarce. Vision is. That was our quote today by William Shakespeare. So if you have the capital and you don't have the vision, maybe you'll just want to go to a place where they will hand everything over to you. And so we find people going to Canada and America and other places and then camping for months, sometimes years, uh, like refugees. You know, they just have a tent that they, they camp. Sometimes people die of, of cold. Uh, you go in the winter and then you have no place that has any form of uh, heat. And then you stay there, you endure the cold. Some people who cannot endure, they give up the ghost just because they want to be abroad or they think that Nigeria is so bad and all that. So we're asking our leaders, what have you done to make sure that our people don't have to go through these? It's, no matter what they feel, they cannot be first class citizens in this country. So what are you doing to protect them back home to make sure that if a hundred people leave every day, maybe it will be cut down to about 20. Let these countries, even that Canada was one of the countries that was, was reducing the, the expectations, the requirements for people to go. And they, they were calling like almost on a daily basis for uh, people who are professionals to migrate to Canada and help them out. Uh, this is the same Canada that is bringing these laws now and talking about immigration laws that will, you know, some people will be affected so much that they will be deported. It's a shame as far as I'm concerned. If I have the money and I visit Canada and I know that I'm coming back in the next one week or one month, uh, the Canadian government will know that it's not because I need them. It's just because I want to unwind and I want to explore. I want to um, make my experience of the world, you know, the wider that's what that's why i'm in their country so they will respect me more not when i'm struggling to go there i want to work there i want to leave there sometimes i'm caught in corners to do that and all that is the fault mostly in africa is the fault of the governments back home making it so hard for somebody to thrive our nigerians who have gone to uh, join other countries to do sports for instance some of them were rejected back in nigeria because they couldn't bribe some of them were rejected in Nigeria. Some of them couldn't train well in Nigeria. They had to go outside the country and all that. Just, that's just an example. So let us make the situation, the condition back home so good that our people wouldn't need to leave. And when they do leave, uh, they will always be thinking about coming home, coming home all the time. But some people, when they leave, like they say in my village, uh, you leave and you're asking that if you have to have any connection with your village, they will have to pack the sand from your village to come and show you because you don't want to step your foot in your village anymore. That shouldn't be the case for any Nigerian. That shouldn't be the case for any African because Africa is more blessed than these countries we're running to, just that we need good leadership. So if you're a leader right now, listening to us and watching us right now, ask yourself, are you that leader that we will remember when you leave the stage? The next uh, top trending issue is that President Bola Tinubu is to present the whistleblowing bill to the National Assembly as his administration reinvigorates the fight against corruption and financial fraud in the country. The Minister of Finance and Coordinating Minister for the Economy, Mr. Wali Edun, disclosed this at the sensitization workshop on whistleblowing policy. According to him, the President Tinubu administration was determined to rally good-spirited members of the Nigerian public to join in the fight against corruption in the country by reporting financial malpractice to the authorities. As part of this whole process to ensure smooth operation of the whistleblower policy, the government is committed to guaranteeing protection from possible reprisals by handling reports, handling information with utmost confidentiality. The policy does provide mechanisms for protection and it is the duty of the government to uphold these provisions and support those who come forward in the interest of the public, those who are public-spirited, brave, courageous, committed, and determined to do the right thing must, should, and will be protected. To this end, uh, Mr. President will be presenting in due course the whistleblowing bill to the National Assembly for necessary processing and legislative action. And we expect that the public will support the quick passage, the prompt and expeditious passage of this uh, all-important bill by the National Assembly. Okay, very good. Um, they are calling on the people to support this bill. 
Uh, what are the provisions of this bill? Can we see uh, details of this bill? It's not enough to just say that it's going to be a whistleblower uh, bill that will be passed to the National Assembly. Let's see the nitty gritty. Let's see the, the fine, fine prints of this uh, bill so that we know, so that we have our own inputs as well. We are the, the citizens that are supposed to blow this whistle and all that. We ask ourselves, what will be the max difference between what will be done by this administration and the previous administration? Because we heard about the whistleblower policy. So does that mean it didn't have legislative backing? They were just doing it for doing sake in the previous administration. What really happened? How far did that bill go? What is it that has been added or removed uh, in this current one that is going to be passed in due course to the National Assembly? Because in due course can be a long, long time. Just like the in due course of, uh, of implementing the Oresanya report it has taken a long, long time and then the uh, Chief of Staff to the President has come out to say there's no timeline for it. So it could be at the end of this tenure uh, before that implement implementation can be done. And in the meantime, before the implementation is done, maybe five more ministries will be created because one has already been created right after uh, promising that ministries will be merged and uh, there's cost cutting and all that that is being planned by this administration. We see a Ministry of Agriculture has been split in two and uh, Oh, so what are we talking about? So what is this timeline? We have not been given. They are saying in due course. So if somebody says, for instance, I'm going to pay you your salary before the end, before Christmas, it can be the next day. It can be on the 24th of December. So that is how it is. So we need to have a timeline. We need to have uh, the uh, the the an insight into what the bill really is, so that if we have a say, we can say it. We can't have that bill passed and tomorrow experts will come out and say, well, this X, Y, Z is not correct. It should not be like that in this bill. So people should be carried along. When you say stakeholders are carried along in any policy that the government is doing, who are these stakeholders? Because the same stakeholders are the ones that come out to say that we were not consulted. This shouldn't have been done. This should have been done differently and all that. So if there's a whistleblower policy, or bill that will be passed to the National Assembly uh, to have legislative backing because we've heard that this bill was there before. So if it didn't have all this, we need to know what it is before it is passed to the National Assembly. And then we will lend our voices to the passage of that bill. We can't lend our voices to something that we do not know how it is. As a person, no matter how much you pray, uh, there are some prayers I don't say amen to because they don't tally with... Uh, with what I believe, for instance, you're playing, praying that God should kill all your enemies. There's nothing that differentiates you from, from a juju man that wants to kill his enemies and all that. So I will not say amen to that. I wasn't taught that way in my own scripture. I was taught to forgive. I was taught to pray for my enemies, to make them change and leave the rest to God. Vengeance is of the Lord. So I don't say amen to all prayers just because you are, you're using sweet words. So I cannot support a bill that I don't know anything about it. If you pray in tongues, I will not say amen because I don't know what you're talking about. My, you might be cursing God for all I care, so I wouldn't say amen. That's the same thing. You're talking in tongues. We don't know what this bill, the provisions are. We were promised this confidentiality in the previous administration. And we have some cases of people who were whistleblowers that got into trouble. Sometimes uh, there's one other one that was a whistleblower and everybody got to know about him and they were all after his money and all that. So let's know what is there and let's be sh sure that we will really have this confidentiality. And how far can we go? For instance, if I know that a governor or a commissioner or a minister is uh, stacking some money and, and, and I want to report, how, how sure am I that I'm going to get uh, these justice or I'm going to get the authorities to act on this information? Because we've seen cases where the people high up can always get their way. Uh, so are we going to be reporting ourselves, you know, the people who are getting the crumbs from the tables of those who should actually be in jail for stealing our money? How are we going to recognize the, the stolen property, the stolen Stolen Ghana must go from the genuine Ghana must go of money that we'll be seeing flying around on the streets. Without, let, let's just know what is in that bill and know what we're supporting or kicking against. 
so that when the time comes, we all will beat our chests and say that we support this, this bill and we're going to do our best to make sure that people are accountable because it's accountability we're looking for. Okay, let's take our third and final uh, top trending issue. Governor Kabiru Abba Yusuf of Kano State has directed the Accountant General of the state to close the bank accounts of all ministries, departments, and agencies. The governor gave the directive at a meeting with the chairman of the Kano State Internal Revenue Service and heads of MDAs at the government house. He said the decision was made to ensure that all government revenues are properly accounted for and utilized for the development of the state finances for effective governance. The Accountant General is also expected to direct all money deposit banks as well as other financial institutions to close all bank accounts, whether IGR or expenditure belonging to any MDAs of the state. The banks are expected to transfer all accounts balances in these IGR and expenditure accounts to the new IGR that is opened by the Office of the Accountant General. The banks are also expected to submit certificates of compliance to these directives to guide the Office of the Accountant General and the Chairman of Kanu Internal Revenue Service for further necessary action. He, uh, the Governor Yusuf assured citizens of the state, particularly the taxpayers, of the effective use of the funds to impact their lives and the economy of the state. Just a comic relief there. Um, he informed, he assured all citizens of the state and especially taxpayers. Who should not be a taxpayer? Everybody in that state is a taxpayer in some way or the other. Uh, either you're paying it directly or you're paying it by proxy or you're paying it in some way or the other. But everybody should even pay tax. It's not like um, we should be evading taxes. Taxes are not meant for only companies and all that. Everybody needs to pay taxes. And that is one thing that we Nigerians don't do very much. A lot of people don't pay taxes, except you have a business that is recognized by government. Unless you're working and um, your taxes are deducted from source and given to the government, uh, unless you're going to a supermarket, for instance, and you're paying the value added tax, um, if you're buying on the streets, that one is lost forever. Uh, so we should form a habit of paying our taxes. But you don't blame people who don't pay their taxes because they are not records. Some people have paid their taxes and the taxpayers' money is being used by some other people for a flamboyant lifestyle and we're not seeing uh, the taxes that we are paying. So sometimes you blame them, sometimes you don't blame them because of the things that are happening. So let it be, let there be a transparent uh, way of accounting for the money that we pay as tax and the money that we is accruable to the state through IGR or from the federal allocation or anywhere. And then uh, people will be encouraged to do the right thing at the right time. So when these accounts are closed and everything is transferred to what the accountant general, uh, the account that the accountant general is opening, I don't know how that will work. I don't know how that that will aid in the effective implementation of whatever the governor wants to do. When there are supposed to be withdrawals for expenditure, will everybody be going to that same account to withdraw? Will they take permission from the accountant general? I don't, I don't understand the workings of this, but um, uh, what is different from the TSA that we were talking about in the previous administration? What even happened to that? Because even at the national level, we still see that ministries, departments, and agencies are having multiple accounts. There are some MDAs that have up to 100 accounts or 80 accounts. And I, I'm just wondering what, why they, do, they need to have all that. Uh, why can't they just be a, a few accounts, maybe one, two, three, uh, to do whatever they need to do? Uh, but I, like I said, I've never been at the corridors of power. I don't know how that works. I don't know how the advantage of having so, so many accounts, uh, maybe the advantage is to the state or the individuals who are making sure that these accounts are opened. But we hope that this move will, according to the vision of the governor, curb corruption in that state. And if it works, let's hope that uh, other states will will borrow a leave and do the same thing. But if it doesn't work, I hope that the government will be humble enough to try another approach uh, of fighting corruption. And then every, every institution that is supposed to uh, be watchful and see 
where corruption may be occurring, uh, should also sit up. ICPC, EFCC, and all that. Humongous amounts of money are being transferred every day from one place to the other that is not supposed to be. And EFCC and ICPC are not flagging them off. And we know these things uh, are not good for our economy. We do hope that the agencies will sit up and do the right thing. Well, kudos to, uh, to Yusuf if that is going to work. If it doesn't work, like I said, be humble enough to try another approach. And all the people who are concerned about the corruption in our land try to innovate, be creative enough to make sure that uh, most of these things that are happening don't happen again and corruption is brought to the barest minimum. And one of the safest things to do is to go technological and see you can, you can trace every cover that is leaving uh, the coffers of government and the ones that are coming into the, the government coffers and where every money that should come to the coffers is now. So go technological. At least it has helped us in paying of salaries. We remember the time when salary was carried in Ghana must go back, for, for, forgive the word, but that's the reigning word in Nigeria, Ghana must go. We know a particular bag that we call that. Uh, they were bringing money f in those bags to local government headquarters, for instance, or state headquarters uh, when it was payday, and then they will be paying by hand. And there was always need for change that was never there. And you leave it, and at the end of the day, you find out these people were making a lot of money. And when governors were trying to change, I remember uh, at one point when uh, Donald Duke, the governor of Cross River, he was one of the first to, to change into electronic payment, how the civil servants were fighting, especially those who were in charge of payments. They didn't want that Gary to leave their mouths, uh, but uh, the governor insisted and everybody became better for it today. So go technological in most of these things and then you'll curb corruption in a lot of ways. Uh, but well, let's leave that to the governors and whoever is in charge. If we are deliberate about fighting corruption, we will get there one day. Um, kudos to everybody who is putting on their thinking cap to make sure that we are corruption free in Nigeria. That's our last stop trending. We'll take a, a short break and look at the weather. And uh, when we return, we'll be looking at the papers. Stay with us.